series called God Will Speak. Last week, if you have your sermon notes, if you notice they're the same notes, it's because we only got done halfway through our through this, the sermon. And so today I want to talk to you about speak. God Will Speak, part two. God Will Speak, part two. And if you have your notes, we're going to pick off where we started off last week about, first of all, before God speaks, you have to prepare yourself for him to speak. So I want to start right there, and then we're going to pick off and go into the new stuff. But preparing yourself for God to speak. Number one is you have to position yourself. In other words, make a place where God and you can meet. So you can get acquainted with God, and God can get acquainted with you. That you take a time to make a place where God can speak to you. Amen? Whether it be in your car, whether it be in your home, on your recliner, wherever it is, make a place for God to speak. Number two is get rid of all the clutter. All the cares, all the worries, all the concerns, all the anxiety that you may have, get rid of that so God can speak through all the clutter. That you want to get rid of that so that God can speak, all right? Number two, and number three, give him permission to speak. That you got to give God permission to speak. God, I'm allowing you to speak into my life. God is a gentleman. He will come by invitation. So you got to give God the permission to speak in my life. As Samuel did, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Another thing we talked about last week, repent of your unbelief, that God help me to overcome my unbelief. God, I believe in Mark 9, 24, the, the, the man said, Lord, I believe, just like all of us believe, but in Mark 9, 24, the man said, Lord, I believe, but help me to overcome my unbelief. And so sometimes we just have to be honest with God, that God, I believe, but Lord, I, I'm struggling with unbelief, so help me to overcome my unbelief. And then the next, next one is let, number five, don't become impatient don't become impatient with him. A lot of times we say, God, I want patience, but I want it now. But God doesn't run on your timetable. God will speak if you will just listen. But don't become impatient. God is not a one-minute God. God is a God that wants a relationship with you. He wants to speak to you. He wants to talk with you. He wants to dialogue with you. But he don't want you to become impatient. And so we have to position ourselves, preparing ourselves, and not become impatient for God to speak to us. Amen? So listen, once you have prepared yourself to hear God's voice. Now, I guess I love this. Once you have prepared yourself to hear God's voice, then you have the attitude that God will speak. You have an attitude. I, okay, God, I positioned myself. I prepared myself to you to speak. Now you're like Psalms 5, verse 3. Early in the morning, I lay my request. As David said, I lay my request. I position myself before you. And then he says, now I wait in expectation. So God, here I am. Lord, I'm waiting in expectation now. I position myself. I have the attitude that God, you will speak to me. Your attitude determines your altitude. So if you want a good attitude, your attitude determines how high you're going to go with God. If you have a stinky attitude, guess what? You're going to have a stinky relationship with God. But my attitude determines my altitude of how high I'm going to go with God. So God, I'm preparing myself. My attitude is with expectation that God, you're going to speak to me. That when God does speak to you, you need this, that you have a spirit of readiness and expectation. In John 10, verse 5, I'm going to pick up where we left off last week. Now the new stuff. In John 10, verse 5, now that you prepared yourself and readied yourself to hear from God, look at what he says. He says this, but they will never follow a stranger. It says they will never follow a stranger. In other words, once you prepare yourself, you're going to be able to be able to distinguish God's voice over the stranger's voice. What is a stranger's voice? The stranger's voice is leading you opposite from the things of God. Anything that leads you from God, leads you away from God, is the opposite voice of who God is. God will never lead you away from him. He will always lead you to him. He will lead you down the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He will never leave you away, but he'll lead you to him. So that stranger's voice always leads you away from God instead of to God. He says, in fact, they will run from him. Don't get back, go back. In fact, they will run, go back. They will, in fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize his voice. Now, I don't know about you, but man, I can recognize my wife's voice. I mean, you know, I, I can recognize her. I can recognize her, man, the tones of her voice, the highs and the lows of her 
her voice. I know that, man, when she's mad, I recognize that voice. I know when she's happy, I recognize that voice. How many know what I'm talking about? I recognize the voice over a lot of other voices. That's my pookie woman's voice. I recognize that voice. She's my woman. She's my, my woman. I love her. But look at this. A stranger's voice is anything that goes against the word of God. So anything that goes against the word of God. So if, the, if you're hearing a voice that's telling you to do this and telling you to do that, that doesn't line up according to the word of God, you need to discard that because God doesn't go against his word. The Bible says that God is a father who cannot lie. He cannot lie. He cannot add or subtract from the word because the Bible says unless we be rebuked. So if the enemy or the voice that is speaking in your ear is having you do content contrary to the word of God, let me tell you something, that is not God's voice. God stands by his word. His word is established forever. It never changes, right? So anything, it says, or anything that may cause you to harm yourself. And so anything, so God will stand by his word. He will not go against his word and he will not cause you to harm yourself. You know, one of the biggest crazes that's going on right now, and I hate even to say this because there's young people in this room right now, but it's so true. And I've been approached by some teachers even in the area, and I won't say where, but they said, Pastor, we have an epidemic that's going on in our schools. And you young people probably recognize this and know this. We have an epidemic that's going on in our school. And I said to the, the, this teacher that came and talked to me, and I said, well, what is that? The epidemic that's going on in our schools right now, our kids are cutting themselves. And they're cutting themselves. And I said, well, they're cutting themselves. And they said, exactly. They're harming their temple. They're cutting themselves. And I thought, why are they cutting themselves? And the teacher said to me, he said, a lot of times they're cutting themselves is because they have so much emotional pain, emotional drama, anxieties and pressures in their life that they're trying to cut themselves with physical pain to try to dislodge the emotional pain, the spiritual pain that they have in their life. So they're thinking that if I take this physical pain, it's going to diminish the emotional pain. And I thought to myself, isn't that exactly in 1 Kings chapter 18, where Baal stood before his men, 450 prophets? And what happened with them people, the 450 prophets? It was Baal and 450 men against Elijah. And what was the rule that what they were doing? They were proving God's. Baal was proving his God, and Elijah was proving his God. And so what was happening, you know the story. They said, what? They said, hey, if your God is for real, man, Baal, call down your God. So Baal and his 450 men began to chant. They began to call on their God, and there was no results, and you know the story. And then what happened? Elijah, he started what? He started taunting them. Where is your God now? How come he's not answering you? And so they got mad. They got frustrated. So what did they begin to do? Exactly what happens with our young people. They found another resort. They tried to find out another aspect of life or how they can alleviate the pain in their life. What did they begin to do? The Bible says that Baal and the men began to cut themselves. They began to take out their swords and kill themselves. Why? Because they tried to get another way to find their God. And so what happens a lot of times when we listen to the stranger's voice, are you listening to the voice that's leading you to God or away from God? A stranger's voice always leads you away from God. Always remember that. And when you're going through a situation in your life, you do this. You measure, you get this now, you measure what direction you're going, not by your feelings or your emotions or what's going on. You measure your direction by what God says in his word. The Bible, the basic instructions before leaving earth. The Bible, that is my compass. That is my atlas. Does that line up to what God is saying? Listen to this. The word, the Lord will never speak to you about harming anyone. That God's, uh, God, that's not God's voice. God will never cause you to harm someone else. Listen, that's why you said in 1 Thessalonians 2, 6, that he's a just God that he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. So here's the cool thing. God says, listen, you got someone that's maybe a nagging toothache to you, that's maybe causing problems in your life. It's not your responsibility to smite them out. 
What you need is you need to transfer that into God's hands and let God judge correctly. Let God take care of the situation. So many times what we want to do, we want to do God's job. And God says, no, let me take care of that situation. And a lot of times when God takes care of the situation, I've always find this to be true. God does things worse than you can even fathom. He said, let me be a just God. Don't you take things into your hands and harm people. Let me deal with it, Chris. God will never cause you, man, to, to, to smite someone out or do something against his word. God's voice brings freedom. Peace and strength to those who hear his voice. Freedom. You see, God said, listen, I bring freedom to your life. Why is that so? Because God's voice says, listen, the truth will set you free. God said, I bring freedom to your life. Freedom and freedom from this. Now get this. The truth will set you free. Freedom from your past. So listen, God, he's, he knows the past and he knows your future. Now, you got to get this. God knows your past and he knows your future, but the enemy only knows your past. Now, you got to get this. He only knows your past. Now, you, are you hearing me? So he only, Jeff, knows your past. So every time when the enemy speaks, guess what he uses against you? Your past. He always brings up your past. But the Bible says in Isaiah that God has blotted out your sins or your past, and he remembers them no more. So whenever the enemy starts speaking to you about your past, you know that that's a stranger's voice. That's not God's voice because the Bible says in Romans 1, 8, verse 1, he said, there is now no condemnation in the Lord for those who love the Lord. So what God does, God doesn't bring up your past because the Bible says, I don't remember this no more, but God brings up your future. But the enemy brings up your past to hold you back from your future. So what he'll do, he'll speak to you, Andy, and says, hey, listen, Andy, man, you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You're not this. You're not that. And what happens is that's weights or hindrances that hold you back to your future. So a lot of times you, you Allow the past to speak into your ear to hold you back from things that God has for you. Man, God has great things in store. He don't want to harm you. He wants to bless you. But so many times you're listening to the wrong voice. And wrong voices make wrong choices. When in doubt, push it out. You got to get rid of that voice. You got to get rid of the noise. Avoid the noise. You got to get rid of that. And when the enemy comes in and tries to take that freedom from you, because the truth will set you free. And some of you are gauging your life by the voice of the past. Stop living in Back in the Future, that movie, Back to the Future. Stop living in the past. Look to your future. And God says, listen, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That's what God says. He looks forward and not backwards. Have you ever noticed on your car? You notice that, man, your windshield is bigger than your rearview mirror? Because God wants you to keep looking forward instead of looking backwards. And a lot of times, maybe if you're looking in your rearview mirror and not looking in front, you're going to have an accident. And so many times the enemy has you looking in your rearview mirror, and God wants you to look out your windshield. You understand what I'm saying? Now watch this. So you say, well, pastor, how does God speak? Well, in our society today, we have many different ways that people speak. You know what I'm saying? We have many different ways. My, my wife, many of you may not know, but try to pull it out of her. She's out of here, so I, I want you to do this for me, all right? Do me a favor, especially you ladies in Bible study. My wife is a great translator. Uh, she really, she knows how to do sign language, and you didn't know that. She used to be on TBN. I don't know if you've ever seen my wife on TBN. She used to do TBN. She was always doing the sign language, and she did the song, Behold Him. And, and, you know, all the TBN people used to come to our church in Oklahoma, so they grabbed her. And so she, my wife has that gift of sign language. Now she put it down, but now, Lisa, you pick it back up in her, okay? Pull it out of her. But people communicate through sign language, Right. I'll tell you, I, I love it when my grandkids, they know more, you know, they, they know that more. My, my kids taught my kids more, you know, and so it's sign language. But then, if you ever notice you get on an elevator, not only do they have the numbers that you push on the elevator, but what's right next to the numbers? It's Braille. 
And you can, man, I don't know how to read Braille, but one time I, I really did. I just closed my eyes and I felt it. And I thought, how can you get one out of that? How can you get two out of that? But that's a way that you can communicate, right? And another way is through walkie-talkies. You can communicate. How many of you remember the day when you were a kid? Remember the old myth that if you take two cans, you take two cans, soup cans, whatever, and you put a hole in each end of it, and you tie the long string, right? But the string was only here to the room, end of the room, but you were supposedly able to hear through the string. Hey, Bill, but you were talking so loud, of course I can hear you. But we fell for that. Remember that? Right? There's different ways that we communicate. You know, one of the coolest things I've ever had happen to me, I was pastoring in Colorado, and we had a guy in our church that he had a trach, and he couldn't talk. So whenever he communicated with me, he would call an operator, uh, and this operator would get on the phone, and then he, the operator would connect me and him together, kind of like a conference call. And what he would do, since he couldn't talk, he had electronic typewriter. And he would type what he wanted to say to me. So when it would come to my ears, it would say, Hi, Pastor CJ, this is Chris. And what happened was he would type it all out, but he was able to communicate even though he had a trick. Right? And so there's different ways physically that we can communicate with one another. But how does God communicate with you? Have you ever thought that? How does God communicate with you? Number one, if you have your notes, look at there. How does God speak? First and foremost, the first and foremost way in which God speaks is this. He speaks through his word. God speaks through his word. He speaks through his word. Listen, listen. Let me say this to you. Why is it that the Bible is the number one selling book? It's the number one selling book, but you know what? It's also the number one least read book. Now, let me say this to you. Your salvation is not built on how many Bibles that you have in your house. Your salvation is built on the relationship that you have with God. You see, there's two different types of ways you can have God or know God in your life. You can have the religious way. You know what religious way is? Religion with God is this. It's man's search for God. That's what religion is, my search for God. But I don't want to have a search for God. The second way that I want in my life is a relationship with God. You see, I don't want to be a religious person because man's search for God, but I want to have a relationship with God, a relationship relationship is where God and I are dialoguing and God is talking to me and I'm talking to God. But one of the means that God talks to us is through his word. And so many times what happens is we are basing our relationship with God on a religion experience. We're searching for God, but we don't know God because we don't allow him to speak to us because we don't read his word. And if his word is basic uh, instructions before leaving earth, then why aren't we applying it and taking it into our lives? Right? So I love this. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, I love this verse. All scripture, if you have your Bibles, you should underline or circle that word. All scripture is God breathed. All scripture, not some. I call some people bucket plunkers. I call them bucket plunkers because of this. Here's what happens. We sometimes are bucket plunker Christians, that we take out the things we like and we remove the things we don't like. So I call them bucket plunkers. I like this, I'll take that. I don't like that, put that back. I like this, I'll take that. I don't like that, I'll put it in a bucket. And we, we're bucket plunkers. We pick and choose what we like and what we don't like. Oh, man, that scripture is not for me. That's for Karen. Oh, man, I, I wish Karen was here right now. Boy, I'll give her what for through that scripture. Man, you should see Karen. I know her inside out and backwards. Man, Karen, if you were here, I'd give you that scripture. And a lot of times what we do is we take and we dissect God's word and we only take the feel-good things of God's word Instead of sometimes taking the correction of God's word, which correction the Bible says in Hebrews, that God disciplines us like a father disciplines his son so that what? So that we can walk upright for God. And sometimes we don't like what we're saying. Oh, I don't like that today. I'm going to turn over to this chapter. I don't like that today. I'm going to go over here. Oh, I'm going to read a Proverbs because everything I seem to be turning doesn't come out right. I'm going to read Proverbs. That's easy. You know what I'm saying? So he says, listen, all Scripture 
is God breathed and is useful. Now watch this for teaching. So notice what it is. It's useful for teaching, instructing, guiding, teaching you along the way. Many of you, I know that all of us have in one way or another, we've been taught something in our lives. Whether maybe you've been taught to change the oil, like my wife taught me how to change oil. I didn't know how to change oil in a car. Thank God I knew a country girl that knew how to change oil. And because she knew how to change oil, she told me how to show, show me how to do it. And now today I can proudly say I know how to change oil in a car. Thank you, Jesus. Right? But I learned how to do it. And what the Bible does, it teaches you how to be what God wants you to be. Like father, like son. How do you take on the image of your father or your mother as you're around them? You communicate with them. You take on the characteristics and the attributes of who your father and your mother are. So he says, rebuking. A lot of us don't like that. Oh, take that one out. I don't like to be rebuked. I don't like to be said no. Amen. I don't like that. No, daddy. I want a golden goose now, daddy. <laughs> right? We don't like the no's of our lives. But God rebukes us to get us back on track. I don't know about you, but I'll tell you, when I was in elementary school, I was uh, not a good student. I was one that would always play mischiefs on the teacher. I'd bring snakes to class and let them go. I'd put a frog in her. I, I kid you not. I used to get my teacher. Uh, man. And our, our, our principal's name in sixth grade, his name was Mr. Blickle. So we'd say, Mr. Blickle, Mr. Pickle. And then we, hey, we got to go to Mr. Blickle, Mr. Pickle's office today. And back in those days, man, you know what they would do? How many of you remember this? They would take out those wooden paddles. Come on, you know what I'm talking about? And believe me, huh? The Board of Education, amen. The school of, the school of hard knocks. N nowadays, if you do that, it'd be the school of jail cells, amen. But you know what Mr. Blickle, Mr. Pickle used to do? I'd pull all these pranks on my teacher, man, and I'd do all this stuff. And you know what? He would take out the Board of School of Hard Knocks. And you know what? It had like little waffle things and little holes in it. So it, it even got faster as it came. <laughs> and man, he'd have you grab your ankles. Man, I can't do that anymore, but back then I can. I'm not flexible anymore. I'm not gumby or pokey anymore, right? But I, I could, be, and he grabbed your hand, whack, and he just hit you one time. He didn't hit you two times, he hit you three times. Before you knew it, man, he lit me up. And before you knew it, man, I finally got it. I ain't doing this anymore to my teacher. But I deserved it, right? I deserved it because I was being irresponsible, and I knew what I was doing was wrong. And so sometimes what God does, he rebukes you or corrects you so that you don't go down that same path. And then it goes on to say, in correcting. And then he says, training you in righteousness. So the whole thing about uh, the Bible leads up to the last step. Training you, Jordan, to become the best man of God that you can be. Training you to become the best man of God that you can be, the best woman of God that you can be, that God is training you through his word. You see, I love this. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, he says these words. In Hebrews 4, go ahead, turn that up there. What she's got, this, turn that, go ahead, put the scripture up there, here, right there. Now watch this. For the word of God is alive and active. How many of you know that we're alive, Right? How many remember the days when you were 30? How many remember the days when your waistband may have been 30? <laughs> now I kind of feel like an auctioneer. Oh, yeah, I got 30. I got 32. I got 34. I got 35. I got 30. You know, you feel like an auctioneer now, right? Deep and you're kind of expanding, right? But it's because you're alive and you're growing. You know, that's the word of God. I can tell you, honestly, I don't know how many times I read the Bible from cover to cover. And every time I read it from Genesis to Revelation, everything in between, I find out one thing. And the central thing of the word, that I always win. You win. You win. But here's the cool thing. No matter how many times I read the word of God, no matter how many times I study and prepare, every time, it never fails. Every time, Karen, that I read the word, I probably read this verse a thousand times, but I go back to it and I learn some new insights. You know why? Because it's alive. The Bible is only boring if you make it boring. 
it's only boring if you allow yourself to be bored by it. So when I have my devotional time with God, write this down. How do I do these things in my life? How do I make the Word come alive to me? If it's forth the correcting and rebuking and all these things, how do I make it become alive? When you're reading the Word of God, number one, ask yourself, what is it saying to me? What is it saying to me? Not to Andy or Rachel or anybody else. Because a lot of times we want to take our devotions in and we want to beat somebody over the head with it. Oh, sick them, God. Man, that scripture needs to go to you. That script. No, it's for you. So what is it saying to you? Number two, how can I apply it to my life? How can I make it evident? How can I apply it to my life? How can I make it real for me? And number three, what can I do and how can I use it for others? What, how can it benefit others? What you've given me, God, how can I benefit others with it? And when I take these three things and, and use it to my life, the Word of God comes alive, Patty. What is it saying to me? God, what do you say? Speak, my Lord. Give me Mickey Mouse ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. How can I apply it to my life? And how can I use it for others? That's what it's good. And it goes on to say, it even it's a sword, it penetrates even the dividing of the soul and spirit. Jorts and Myers, it judges the thoughts you're thinking, thinking, because everything that you think is opposite of what God thinks. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. You ever want to pull yourself out of a state of depression? Maybe a place of anxiety in your life, which we all go through. We all go through the valleys. You know what you begin to do? Get your thoughts off your thoughts and start thinking about God's thoughts. And you know what God's thoughts are? Man, he loves you. He cares about you. Man, he's, he thinks the best for you. That's the thoughts that God has. And so a lot of times what happens is we get on our thoughts. And a lot of times we're our own worst critic. And a lot of things that we imagine, they never even happen. You took an anthill and you made it into a mountain. Now you got to pray. You say to this mountain, be you cast into the sea and have no doubt in your heart. Because you created a mountain. Come on, isn't that true? And so a lot of times God says, don't, don't, th hey, that's not my thoughts. When you start putting yourself down, remember the enemy reminds you of your past. God reminds you of your future. The only thing the enemy knows about you is your past. Had to push it out, wouldn't pay the rent, right? Isn't that right? What did the enemy do to Eve? The enemy came to Eve and Adam and said, hey, did God really say that? What's he do to you? Jamie, did God really say that? Do you really believe that, Sarah? And when you start thinking, you get down on yourself, getting depressed, you just start thinking of God's thoughts. You know what the Bible says? I love this. This is God's thoughts, Bill. God created, he took seven days, created the heavens and the earth and, you know, all the things. And then on the seventh day, guess what? On the sixth day, who did he create? You. And you know what was cool about that? After he created you, guess what he said? He created you very good. Isn't that cool? That God says, Summer, I didn't create your average because the average person today loves to live in the C area. C, the C minus to a D. That's what the American society lives in. Look it up for yourself. We are average people that live in the C, the C minor, and the D plus area. That's where our grade scale is. But God didn't make you C level. God made you A plus. And he says, listen. He says, Chris, I made you very good. Very good. So whenever you're feeling down, you say, oh, no, that, that, ain't, that ain't for me. Listen to this. Listen, I, I love this. I, you got to have the word. And if you have your notes there, listen. The moment you open your Bible is the moment God starts speaking. So here's your Bible. Here's your Bible, right? Man, full of dust. God's been waiting for you to open it up. But guess what happens when you open it up? God goes, what's up? So he said, he's like, what's up? And you know what else he said? Where you been? I'm starving to talk to you. Man, you've been suffocating God because you haven't opened the pages. And God's saying, what's up? Right? 
because you now finally cracked the Bible. You say, listen, not opening your Bible is like God not opening his mouth. He speaks through his word, so open his word. Now listen to this. God speaks through prayer, and I'm going to blow through this now. God speaks through prayer. Prayer is the key that opens your ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. I always say this. Prayer is the key in the morning and the bolt at night. It's the first thing that you open your day with, and it's the last thing you close your day with. Man, I open my day with prayer, and I close my day with prayer. When I close it in prayer at night, I pray, God, protect my mind. Don't let me have all this imagination, Lord. Don't let me think about things that I don't need to be thinking about. Don't let me have nightmares. Don't let me have dreams, Lord God, that don't line up to your word. So, God, I open my day with prayer, and I bolt my thoughts with night. Like prayer is the vault that keeps the negative out of your system. It's the lifeline to, to God. You see, that's why it says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Very simple. Look at what it says. Here's what 5.17 says in 1 Thessalonians. Very simple. Pray continuously. Remember I talked about yes last week? Don't let God become the God of crisis. Let God become the God of cross. Let him become the God of the cross. That I love you, God, even when I don't feel like it. I love you, God, even when I'm on the mountain peaks. I'm going to serve you, God. Even when I'm down, I'm going to serve you. Even when I'm up, and I'm going to pray continuously. You see, you want to keep your gas tank full? Don't pray when you're empty. Pray all the time to keep full. I love this, man. How many of you know that, man, when you go and fill your truck up, man, it costs you 100 bucks to fill it up. But I like it when I fill it up when it's only half full because it's only 50 bucks. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> right? Don't go to God all the time. Pray every day. Number three, God speaks through people. God speaks through people. You and I. If Listen to this. If God can use a donkey, when he said to Balaam, don't cross over that fence, can't God use you? And that's why he says in Proverbs 27, 17, look at what he says. He says that God says this, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. In other words, we're here to be files to each other, to encourage each other, to uplift each other, to love each other, to sharpen each other, to help each other along the way. That's why it says two are better than one. Pity the man who doesn't have a friend to pick him up when he falls. So he said, listen, man, hey, I'm here to help you out. You see, I've always said this. Now, write this down. There are two types of people that you can hang out with in your life. Two types. I always choose this one. You can have the stairs and nairs. The stairs and nairs are like, we're doomed. We're never going to make it. We're going under. Man, we're not. This is my, hey, I, I, I'm dumb. I'm never going to, oh, man, you can't do this. You can't do it. You know what? The Bible says in the Word of God, I can do all things through Christ. God's vocabulary doesn't say can't. It says can. And we get people, man, you can have the stairs and nairs that can kill your dreams Man, can man take the wind out of your sails? Or you can choose like I do. Be with the runners and the hunters. The people that want to do something in life. The people that, man, want to help you, encourage you, and support you, and uplift you, and blow into your dreams, and believe in you. Man, you need to surround yourself with runners and hunters. Get away from the stairs and theirs, those that are zapping you. Man, you ever get that? You go to a party sometimes. Man, you leave the party. You're happy, happy, happy. Those are the runners and hearts. But maybe you left the party and left worse than when you came. Because, man, all they did was drain from you. Right? Got to get away from those. Look at I love this. And so it's, it's this. God places people in our lives to encourage, uplift, and to speak into our lives to help us grow and get closer to him. Man. Hey, in this journey, two are better than one. Where two or three agree, it shall be done. God puts you in our lives, one another. Man, Andy sharpens me. Man, Bill sharpens me. You sharpen me. And I pray that I can sharpen you. It's, not, it's a lonely, lonely place out there all by yourself. You ever heard the song? One is the loneliest number that you ever knew. And sometimes that one, sometimes that one, is you sometimes that one is you and God doesn't want you to be abandoned because listen the enemy always looks for the weakest one and when you're on your own guess what he comes in with legions he comes back with many and he attacks the one but with two or three agree it shall be done I, I have to jump quickly he says this I love this 
in Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 12, and I'm going to close here. I want you to see about this. They're talking about the five-fold ministries of the church. you got to get this now, okay? You are in this five-fold ministries of the church. And there's five-fold ministries of the church. And our, check this out. And in those five-fold ministries of the church, guess what? They're stirring up the gifts. Every one of them are speaking into your life. Look what he says. So Christ gave the apostles... The apostles, the man to look forward to, to show you history, to bring you into the knowledge of Christ, to speak into your life. The prophets, the foretellers, the foreseers of what's ahead of you. Notice what God is saying. God knew that I had to give you the fivefold ministries of the church to keep you on track, to speak into your life to guide you and to direct you and to navigate you through the storms of life into the valleys, into the highs of lows of your life. Then he goes on to say, the evangelists. I love having evangelists come to your church because you know what? I call them hit and runs. They come and they hit the church and they stir it all up, get it all, all in a mess, and then you're left pissing up the pieces. But the evangelist is like the igniter that starts the fire. Then he says the pastor. The pastor who, who's there to shepherd, to, to encourage, to feed, to guide. And then there's the teachers to instruct. Every area of the fivefold ministries talks about speaking in your life. The question is, Barb, are we listening? Gail, that's the question. Are you listening? You see, you can let it go through one ear out the other, or you can receive it. Are you listening? You see, a prophet is one who sees the future and even sees things that might not see. I'm going to jump down. God speaks through circumstances. God speaks through circumstances. Sometimes God uses events to get your attention and to teach you something in the midst of your struggle. Ever felt like a d one that's chasing your tail, always going around that same tree? You've been around that same tree so long that you got a path worn out. Maybe, just maybe, you're not learning in your circumstances. Everything in life is to teach us, to help us, to get us stronger and better. It's not to make you bitter, but it's to make you better. And God doesn't want to make you bitter. He wants to make you better in life. He wants you to fire on all cylinders. So what he's saying, he said, Rachel, I don't want you to be bitter. I want you to be better. And a lot of times we get bitter. Now get this. A lot of times we get bitter because we keep going around the same tree. And so because we keep going around the same tree and never learning from our circumstances, the next thing we do, we get mad at God. And all along, God has been trying to speak to us, but we're not listening. You see, it in James it says there, and I don't have to go there, but when asking, it teaches us to listen so God can speak. God wants to speak. We can ask all we want, but we have to listen to what he has to say. And that's what God wants to do. And God wants to speak in your life. Trust me, he does. God is not mute like we talked about last week. He speaks. But the question is, you got to undo the mute button. Allow him to speak in your life. He doesn't show favoritism. Even though at times you may think he does, he doesn't. He's not a respecter of person. He created you just like anybody else, fearfully and wonderfully. My, hey, I put on my clothes the same way you do. I put on my shoes the same way you do. I take a shower the same way. Hey, we all do the same. Right? But now you have to do your part. So today I want to encourage you today. Allow God to speak. And if you haven't been reading your Bible, let me encourage you. Don't have to jump in and have a marathon. Just start out. God don't care how fast or how slow you go. He just wants you to go. Start out. When I was young like you guys, man, just getting into college, man, you know what I did? I had three by five cards, and I'd just take a scripture. And I'd take that scripture with me, and I'd just meditate on that scripture. It's just something very simple, very small. But that thy word have I hidden in thy heart 
that I might not sin against God. And a lot of times we sin because we didn't know the rules. Did you hear what I said? A lot of times, Deb, we sin because we don't know the rules. But if you know the rules, which is God's word, it will prevent you from sinning and you have an easier life. Will you stand with me today? God is so good. Are you ready to eat today? I don't know about you. Your son's going to be in there. I tell you, we're going to have a great time. And what we're going to do is going to go up to my right, guys. It'll all be fixed up there. And my wife and Pastor Andrew will give you instructions. But I want to pray over you today. I really do. Rachel, I'm so proud of you. I, I see such a change in you today, your countenance. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Praise the Lord. Father, I thank you for today. Lord, I pray that, God, you let us be a church, Lord, that hears, hears your voice. That, God, we give you permission to speak into our lives. That, God, we're not going to be afraid or compromised, Lord God. We're going to study your word and show yourself a proof of workmen not to be ashamed. Lord, that is our goal. We're going to allow people maybe that we respect, Lord, that to speak into our lives. Maybe they see the blind spots of our lives that we ourselves don't see. And I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that we will learn through our circumstances, not become bitter, but become better, that we'll learn from them and move on. And I praise you, Father, for opportunity to speak to you through prayer. That's our lifeline to heaven. Lord, I thank you for every individual here today. Bless our time together today, our last Sunday in this building. And I pray, God, that you will move us forward into the new things that you have in store for us at the high school as we expand our tent stakes for your glory, for your honor. Bless the food now, bless the time, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you today. God bless you.